Live theater is an artistic compelling and in many cases a transformative experience for theater goers, those responsible for creating what audiences see on stage, the actors, directors, costume designers, scenic designers, playwrights, and composers. They represent the artistic legion of the stage. But behind the curtain and beyond the performance stands another equally important legion of theater workers. While their role is not as glamorous, it is truly vital. I'm talking about the business side of the theater. The people involved in this all-important undertaking are the general managers, the accountants, and others who help the producer avoid the many pitfalls along the way. One of the most important players on the business side is the lawyer. Despite what the great bard William Shakespeare was reputed to have said, first, kill all the lawyers. Lawyers are the engine that enable producers to work properly, legally, and efficiently, raising money, creating budgets, drawing up contracts, negotiating with the unions. These are just a, a few of the areas that need the protective oversight of an attorney. I'm Mike Merrick, theater producer. Today we are pleased to have a leading attorney in many areas of endeavor, Mr. James Donovan. I recently spoke with Mr. Donovan at the Center Theatre Group in Los Angeles, where he graci graciously shared with us the benefit of his long and varied experience in the theatre, his advice on such necessary practices as dealing with investors, royalty structures, and other complex but basic requirements is important for everyone who ever hopes to someday produce a project for the theater. I'm very pleased today to have as my co-host and actually uh, an expert on various facets of the entertainment industry and other industries, my good friend, Mr. Jack Wishner. Jack, thank you for being here. Good afternoon, Mike. Good to be here. Thank you. Jack is president and chief executive officer of CP America, which is a rather unique company because uh, he will tell you about it better than I, but Jack has dealt with is dealing with currently making deals with uh, the infamous and very well-known Donald Trump, who is very active here in Las Vegas, very recently with Wayne Newton, Michael Flatley, the famous world dancer. And Jack, because he deals with the business side and to a great extent the entertainment world, brings a compelling and outside view of what we need and what we should address in the theater. Jack? What are your uh, views generally on your uh, uh, involvement, if you will, with the business world as linked to the theatrical world? Well, as uh, president and CEO of CP America, we're a consulting firm that specializes in uh, creating business deals for the corporate community and to a limited extent the entertainment community. Uh, here in Las Vegas uh, we've worked with some major gaming companies in terms of looking at their entertainment content and uh, I believe we can kind of share with you today some of the uh, programs and business side of the equation that would relate uh, very nicely to what you're talking about in terms of live theater. In view of the fact, that's, that's very interesting, and I'm familiar with it knowing you as well as I know you, in view of the fact that we're having an attorney who deals with these things from the contractual point of view, et cetera, raising money, how do you think at this juncture that that aspect of it relates to what you have to do sure. with various sure. projects? Yeah. <clears throat> I look at live theater as a business and uh, you know although there's the creative aspect to it uh, and uh, surely has some unique aspects uh, to live theater <clears throat> to me business is business <clears throat> live theater there are um, 
elements within live theater that you will find traditionally within every business deal. Uh, whether it's going out and putting together a creative uh, a team, uh, you would do that on the corporate side in, in terms of putting together a, a, uh, a talented management group. Uh, you would be raising money on the uh, theatrical side in live theater. You would also be looking at private placements and uh, equity investment on the corporate side. Uh, you would be looking at uh, dealing with unions, dealing with lawyers, contracts, uh, as, and such. The same thing would apply on the business side of the equation. So in my familiarity, although my background is really geared towards uh, the corporate side, when I have crossed over, so to speak, uh, and uh, ventured into the entertainment community, I found that the business side of that equation was exactly the same as every other business uh, I've ever been involved in. So what you're saying essentially is that there is a common denominator, if you will, between what you do, which is not necessarily within the framework of legitimate theater, but nevertheless, it's a business, it deals with entertainment. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the structure that you feel was necessary in your uh, evaluating and evolving the deal with Donald Trump here in Las Vegas? Sure. The, uh, and again, I'll relate it to similar elements that you would find in, uh, let's say, structuring or capitalizing a live theater project. Uh, uh, similar to a producer, uh, my role and what I took on in terms of my role was to create an opportunity for Donald Trump to come to Las Vegas and build a uh, super luxury high-rise hotel condominium on the Strip. Um, and uh, it's currently under construction, the deal is done. But if you go back and you look at, in, in kind of a fishbowl, you look at the, uh, what went into the mechanics of putting that deal together, it, it is not dissimilar to mounting a production from scratch, where you would have to identify the property, you would have to identify the investors, you'd have to raise the capital, you'd have to bring parties together, uh, and then you'd have to mount the show. Uh, and in essence, all of those are incorporated into the deal that we just consummated with sure. Donald Trump mm -hmm. on the Strip. I understand that. And now, all of a sudden, with the seeming uh, invasion, if you will, of uh, legitimate theater projects in Las Vegas, such as, uh, well, Mamma Mia has been here a while, and We Will Rock You, and the forthcoming Hairspray at the end of 2005, and then in 2006, of course, Phantom of the Opera. You, as an individual who works with these varied elements, how do you see that deal differing, if you will, from what is done for Broadway or on the road? Very good question. Um, and, and I see it differing in a lot of respects. Uh, <clears throat> unlike Broadway, which traditionally houses theatrical productions in smaller venues, uh, the problem, as I would see it, would be that the producer could sometimes be handicapped in terms of uh, you have a lot of union rules, you have uh, a, a limited availability of tickets to sell, if let's say there are 600 seats, etc. And sometimes mounting a show into a particular legitimate theater in Broadway that may be 60 or 100 years old may not be technologically sophisticated enough to handle that show. What you have here in Las Vegas is a little unique, is uh, primarily you can design the theater to complement the show. And that's what you find here in Las Vegas, where We Will Rock You is in a theater that was designed for it. You look at all the uh, old productions, etc. It's designed for those particular shows. Okay, I think that's very interesting. I think we should take a look at uh, uh, what Donovan has to say now, the interview that I did with him. And I think you mentioned to me before we went on the air about a question that you had pertaining to that. Yeah, my, my curiosity is in terms of uh, identifying a, a project, uh, are there rights that have to be acquired and how would those rights uh, in, in, in essence be acquired? Well, why don't we see what Donovan has to say about that? Great. Why don't you tell us your views on the initial steps in acquiring the rights to a play. The first step to any production is making sure that the production and the client has the appropriate rights. And I analyze rights from two points of view. Either the client is going to be producing an existing property 
or they're going to be actually creating a whole new show. In the first instance of an existing property, what you do is you have to clear the rights. And there are a number of organizations, such as Samuel French Company, where you go and get the rights. Now, you have to make sure you get as many rights as possible. So you have to be very careful with the client, finding out what the client's agenda is. Most times, you would get the rights for a specific presentation, classically in New York. But then you would also want to make sure that you had rights for ancillary and subsidiary rights, and also the possibility of a London production, and also a right after New York to take it out on the road. <clears throat> now, it's completely different in the case of an original work <clears throat> where your client is going to actually create a play. Which I have done in the past, and yes. it's a whole new, yeah, please go ahead with that. Okay. In that case, you have to then account for a greater body of rights and make diff additional arrangements. <clears throat> For instance, a play may be based on a book, so you would have to arrange to have the rights for the book. Then you would have to arrange for a writer to prepare an original play for you. In both of these instances, you want to be careful of where the copyright resides. The best thing from an investor's point of view is for the copyright of an original play to be owned by that partnership, and that would be owned by the partnership in perpetuity. So after the play is presented, the partnership would have ongoing income from additional productions or, for instance, from movies, merchandising, and similar types of ancillary rights. By the partnership, you mean the limited partners as well as the general partners. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Most productions are financed in a legal format of either a limited partnership or what we call a limited liability company. And these are used basically for tax purposes because a partnership and a limited liability company incur no tax liability in and of themselves. All of the tax benefits pass down onto the personal returns of the partners, whether they're the general partner or the limited partner. In that uh, short segment, Jack, that we saw when I spoke with James Donovan, uh, I would like to get your views on how what he said, specifically focused in on theater, relates in general to your business, to what you do, to what your requirements are. Sure. I, I can see from that why a lot of uh, individuals in the business world are attracted to theater because the elements that Jim Donovan uh, uh, specifically talked about are inherent in almost every major company or company that gets structured. Uh, you would look, look at the tax ramifications of structuring a company. Is it better to have a partnership, an LLC, an LLP? Uh, is it better to have a Delaware company versus a New York Excuse company? Excuse me, why don't you explain what an LLC and LLP is because many of our students who are watching may not be familiar sure. with it. It's a limited liability corporation, limited liability partnership, which you would find in the legitimate theater community, which uh, without getting technical, because I'm not a lawyer or an accountant, but without getting uh, technical, it's limiting the liability of the partners in that entity. So if there are five partners, the, the liability, God forbid something happens, the partners are not personally liable for any uh, catastrophic uh, problems. Um, getting back to what I was saying, uh, you will find in the business world that you have to look at how to set up the partnership. Uh, you want to look at, uh, as, as uh, uh, Jim Donovan was saying, uh, looking at acquiring certain royalties and rights that you want to maintain in that partnership that, in essence, once the play, let's say, closes on Broadway, you then have ownership of those assets that you can now take and do a road show, you can take and, and put into another venue, you could even sell merchandising, not dissimilar to the way Walt Disney Company would have right. uh, rights and yeah. royalties on their own branding. Right, I understand all that. You know, he mentioned something in there that I think everybody's ears may have gone up if they're all sensitive to the aspect and who isn't. Tax ramifications. Those two words make people shudder. Now, how are the tax ramifications within the framework of a theater venture if you're a limited partner and investor compare with generally what you do that may not be within that 
theatrical world, if you will. Sure. And, and again, I'll go back to what I said originally, Mike, which is uh, there's the creative side of theater, and then there's the business side of theater. Uh, the business side affords the creativity. Uh, so the business side is very critical, whether it's in theater or whether it's in corporate America. Right. And therefore, on the business side, you always want to make sure that you're maintaining uh, uh, a sophistication where you're paying the least amount of taxes, obviously legally, uh, paying the least amount of taxes, having the most amount of gain so that the partners can have a return on their investment that they are uh, involved in. And, and one of the next questions, uh, probably it may be addressed by uh, Jim Donovan's uh, meeting with you, but uh, it's from the investment standpoint. Uh, how uh, uh, how does a theater producer uh, look to uh, uh, raise capital? Where does the capital come from? Uh, how is that capital treated, which I'm sure is vital to any business uh, growing sure. and survival, sure. as I'm sure it is in the theater. Well, yes, no, no question about it. It's rather complicated, and I believe he's going to address that in a couple right. of conversations that we'll look, on and look in on in a few moments. But meanwhile, uh, with reference to that, it seems to me that there is a compelling, if you will, a wedding, if not a wedding, certainly some kind of an engagement uh, between the world of commerce and the world of art. You know, certain producers who say, I'm a creative producer. Well, I call myself a creative producer, but nevertheless, you better know what's going on on the bottom line. Now, how does commerce and art link itself inextricably link itself sure. in the general things that you do like what you did with Flatley for example that I mentioned a few moments ago who was going to do something sure. etc. And, and, and Flatley is uh, you know the Lord of the Dance and yeah. that is entertainment but I'll address your question and answer your question uh, a, a little bit better in terms of how does commerce and theater blend uh, and take a plain vanilla company, not an entertainment company. Let's say that company is in consumer products or, or uh, 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 manufacture school supplies. Uh, and now they're looking to raise capital. If they're looking to raise capital in the Wall Street community, they have to go on what's called a road show. In essence, they have to put together the concept of the company. They have to get all uh, all the ducks in order in terms of what that company is going to be doing. And then they dress up for the part, and they go into corporate America to raise funds. Isn't that called a dog and pony dog show? Dog and pony yeah. show, absolutely correct, Mike. Yeah. And so that's what they're doing. So if you're looking for a convergence of corporate America and live theater or legitimate theater, Again, every time you put those two together, you're going to find that the mechanisms in both are almost identical in terms of what the methodology is and what the end result has to be. So there is, a, to use a high-class word because we're dealing with students, a symbiotic relationship, if you will, a blending, a common a thrust and a common need and a common knowledge between commerce and art. You can't say anymore, I'm just an artist, I don't want to be involved, or I just want to deal with commerce. If you're dealing with some form of art, I would say the two have to blend and overwhelm each other. That's Not right. overwhelm each other, but nevertheless blend together. That's right. They you work know. hand in hand. Yeah, they if do. It's, if you're purely corporate America, you, you have elements of live theater and production in corporate America. If you're in legitimate theater, you're going to have a lot of elements of corporate America in order to survive and thrive, so to speak, in terms of the production itself is going going to be based on business uh, elements that you would find anywhere else. You know, that's very interesting. I'd like <clears throat> to get your views on something that we spoke about in a prior session, and that was the seeming takeover of large corporations, whether it be Disney or Clear Channel Entertainment, doing shows not only on Broadway, but all over the United States. Does that, in your view, with your fresh viewpoint, and I mean that, in any way pose a, not only a challenge, but a danger to the independent producer, here I am, you know, who may sure. be referred to as their dinosaurs, or is it a whole new kind of a thrust for them? What is your view on that? Well, my view is, is quite simple. When you talk in terms of corporate America, and you look at any other element of corporate America, in order for corporate America to 
survive and thrive, uh, what they do is primarily offer a full service package. Uh, and that, if it relates to consumer products, uh, it wouldn't just be deodorant and uh, a baking soda and cleaning supplies. And they want that brand to have a loyalty. They want customers to come, and if they're going to buy the deodorant, they're also going to buy baking soda, etc. It's the same company, it's a familiarity. The same thing corporate America has then looked at and applying currently to the entertainment community where you have a company like Clear Channel. Clear Channel will want to own the billboard that is advertised on, the radio station that you advertise and get advertising dollars for, the live legitimate theater. Uh, they want to produce shows. So they're, in essence, offering a full service package uh, similar to if they were in a consumer products company. Okay, but I would, I would think that, in a way, what it does is inspires the independent to do something because independence, I think, and I think you'll agree with me, will always thrive and survive. They just have to change the venue. Look, so, at, look, at, the, look at the motion picture uh, community. The behemoth organizations are not doing as well as the independent film that's producers. That's right, and that's why they, you know, Absolutely correct. that's why. Yeah. So I think it's important to, uh, to just salute the independents. Here I am, Absolutely. I'll take the bow very nicely, you know. And, uh, now that uh, we're going to go back to another segment with Donovan. I hope and, it's uh, that segment on uh, what I'm uh, uh, curious about is the raising of investment dollars and investors in the theatrical world and that whole process. How they do that, right? Yes. Okay. Of course, typically money comes from individual investors, the famous angels. Yeah, the angels. Right. The other sources, which are frequently overlooked, is you can mount a show by cobbling together a number of financial resources, investors, corporate sponsors, or in-kind contributors. For instance, you may have a show and someone, for instance, a regional theater, would agree to build the sets and the costumes. In return for that in-kind contribution, they would become entitled to a percentage of the partnership's profits, losses, credits, and distributions. And that also lowers the capitalization of the required money to be raised because they build the sets of the costumes, right? Right. It requires less cash. Right. Now, investors typically write you a check in connection with the production. But also, investors have opportunities of contributing to the capitalization, for instance, by providing the bonds in connection with major shows. There are substantial amounts of money that need to be committed in connection with bonds. Explain bonds to our viewers, will you? A bond, for instance, the classic bond in a live theater production is the actor's equity bond to make sure that the show doesn't close and leave the cast without compensation. So many shows, major shows in New York, for instance, they may have weekly cast costs literally in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. While there are many exceptions, the typical rule of thumb to keep in mind is you have to have approximately two weeks of compensation. Now that uh, Jim Donovan, I think, definitively explained the raising of money, not that it's easy, it's one of the most difficult things in the world. What I want to ask you, Jack, that in the theater there are general partners who are really the producers, who are totally responsible for everything. The limited partners, the investors, are not responsible if something goes wrong, somebody owes money. How does that work in your world, if you will, even though it may be linked to the entertainment industry? It's, it's not unique to the entertainment industry. I was smiling as I was watching the, uh, the videotape of Jim Donovan. Uh, it's not unique. Why is it not unique, Mike, is because if, if I was starting a company again tomorrow, uh, the same ways that you would capitalize a show is the exact same method and process that I would take to capitalize a new company. I would look for an angel investor, an angel investor who would come in and uh, offer just money into the equation for a percentage of uh, the revenues that that company and the profits that that company would generate. Uh, the same way we would have a limited group of investors uh, coming in and investing in a company, they're coming in and investing in a show. Don't lose sight, Mike, of the fact that 
the way Jim Donovan is talking, why I was smiling, is individuals aren't really investing in a show. They're investing in the company that's mounting the show. So it's the same. It's not where they're directly <coughs> investing in the show. But they're investing in that partnership that is then mounting the show. But nevertheless, aren't they totally involved and curious about what does the partnership present? What is within the form of the show? Who is in the show? That's why it's different. I would, I would think, tell me if I'm wrong, that an investor would readily impart with monies to invest in the show if there was a big star in it. You know? Absolutely correct. Just the same way, like if you look at uh, investing in a, a, a company that's non-entertainment, they're investing in the company, but they're investing in that company. And that's why you'll read in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times that uh, such and such company just hired a CEO, a star CEO oh, yeah, yeah. that would be like a star in the legitimate theater. So that's used as an attraction to investors to pony up the money, invest in, the, in that uh, limited liability company, just as if they were investing in a limited liability company that manufactured widgets. Um, but it's again, the CEO would be the star oh, of that particular partnership. How much do investors people put money into a, a company, how much do they have to say about the running of the company, about the plans for the company? I mean, are they allowed, I mean, if, if it's a, a public company, I understand what happens. But let's say a private individual gets investors to come in. How do they allow, how do they function with those investors, and what do they have to say about, sure. we don't like that or we like that? It's, it's, it's the same as what we're talking about here as it pertains to mounting a, a legitimate theatrical production. Uh, it's not a publicly held company. It's a limited liability company. You're going out, as uh, a Jim Donovan uh, would say, to raise capital maybe in a, a private placement memorandum. Right. The same if I was going to look to capitalize a company that I would be forming, I would put out a private placement memorandum. And then it's depending upon how you want to structure it. Most of the time, what you'll find in legitimate theater is you don't want the investors telling you how to run the show. Uh, and how. Absolutely. So <laughs> it's called a passive investment. They're making a passive investment in that company. Therefore, they're getting a, a return on that investment, but they really don't have a dramatic say in terms of how that production or uh, a company is run. The reason they don't have a dramatic say is because most of those investors are not in any fashion whatsoever familiar with what is required of a theatrical production. However, they get their kicks, if you want to call it that, sure. they're additional by getting billing. Sure. A guy puts up a reasonable amount of the capitalization, he's going to want his name up there. That's why today you see, oh my goodness, nine producers, how the heck do they make money? They just get the billing. How does that work within the industrial complex, if you will? How do these people get credit? Or are they not interested in credit? Well, uh, from, uh, on the uh, corporate side, uh, in a traditional company that's non-theatrical. Uh, and again, the theatrical element, one of the reasons why a person invests in a theatrical uh, production is for that glory, so to speak, right, in terms yeah. of putting their name and seeing their name maybe in a playbill, etc. What you'll the find... The opening night party. That's right, the opening <laughs> night party, etc. And that's one of the attractions or lures sure. that legitimate theater has to the investment community. Uh, on the corporate side, there are other values that are received. Uh, and if you look at, again, I'll, I'll reference Disney, uh, McDonald's, those type of companies where, believe it or not, if you're a shareholder in those companies, you'll get discounts or free passes to the uh, amusement parks or hamburgers at, uh, at McDonald's uh, at certain times of the year. So you have a, an attraction and a loyalty to that particular company, and you're getting your kind of name above the title, so to speak, yeah. in other ways. Yeah. You would find that in, in the corporate Side. Don't you think that, Jack, that over the last number of years, the wide separation between the entertainment industry, theater specifically, that we're talking about today, and the industrial complex has really kind of changed and frittered away where there's been a blending of the two? 
That there isn't yeah. that much differential? It used to be where it was maybe a, uh, a, 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 a very wealthy patron of the theater right. would actually have invested money in the theater. Maybe they wanted to put in a, uh, a, a young family member, et cetera, into the theater uh, and, and give them a minor role in the production. Uh, but what, <laughs> what, what, what you find now is you look at a, a lot of corporate structures uh, are looking at theatrical productions as obviously a form of entertainment and in, in a way similar to what Jim was saying in terms of branding you know the theater owners because as I said in terms of the legitimate theater on Broadway let's say or the West End of London you're constricted in terms of the size of the theater therefore as a producer you are looking to get money from let's say other elements such as uh, uh, branding I understand and uh well, we'll take a look at uh, uh, Donovan again. You've had some very good questions in the past. You have one specific question that you want to address to the next segment? Sure. I'm interested in terms of, you know, now I understand how it's capitalized in terms of a show. How is the return to investors made in terms of the profits of the, of the show and, and what is the return to the investors? Talking about royalties and things royalties, of that Royalties, how that's set up and, and the return to the investors. Well, let's find out what he said when I spoke with Great. him. Great. Royalties, in shorthand, are paid off at the top. They're one of the monies that are paid out first before investors recoup their investment. Royalties to these people either are handled on a one-by-one -one situation, and royalties typically in these cases are expressed as a percentage of the gross weekly box office receipts. It's advantageous to the raising and capitalization of productions to have the royalties placed into a pool. And that pool then is divided amongst the various royalty participants. In a recent show that I had the opportunity to assess for the investors, royalties amounted to approximately 20% of gross weekly box office, with about 3% in that particular production going to the producer as the producer's compensation for putting the show on. Royalties then have to be dealt with on a shifting basis. And the investor benchmark is called recoupment, which is when the investors have gotten their money back. The structure of a theatrical financing should always be premised on getting the investor their money back at the earliest possible right. point right. in time. Is that why we do pools? And do you want to explain? Isn't it true, though, let me ask you this. I mean, I know the answer, but perhaps many of our viewers don't, that if you want to do a pool where everybody gets an equal amount until recoupment, is it true that if one person, one royalty participant, says, I don't want to be in the pool, that the whole thing can be jeopardized? The answer is no, because you would just keep that, that person out and deal with the remaining people that did want to pool. But how do you keep them out? Then you would have to pay that one person his right. full royalty, right. and the rest of the people willing to take, let's say, half royalty. That's right. not very fair, is it? It depends on the business realities of the transaction. Yeah. And, and so the producer these... would have to use all good efforts to make sure that everybody participates in the Correct. pool. Right. Some people won't negotiate with you. They want X percent of the box office from day one. You hope that people would take a smaller royalty at the beginning and then get a larger royalty right. after the investors have recouped their investment. Right. But uh, then again, with, let's talk about the love of the theater, if you'll forgive me. It doesn't fall into the category of legality and doesn't fall into your area. But nevertheless, I guess what you have to do if you want to get a name is somebody who wants to do something because they love the theater, uh, which is extremely difficult to do. Consequently, in order to keep it going, you want to work out a structure whereby the general partners who are the producers are taken care of, and most importantly, at the inception, the limited partners are taken care of. One thing I want to ask you that's important, you mentioned in our, many of our discussions that we've worked together, the participation of the limited partners, the investors, in ancillary rights like merchandising, etc. Tell us about that a little bit. Well, as I said earlier in my remarks, those rights are owned by the partnership. So, for instance, in the case of a, of a new play, specially created and owned by the partnership, if, for instance, the play was taken and made into a motion picture, the fees paid by the motion picture producers would become income to the partnership, and the general partner and the limited partners would share 
pro rata in accordance with their respective investments. Yeah, well, that's, that's true. But let me ask you this. What happens when you have a play that opened in New York, and then you have another company, let's say that goes to London. Do the original investors in the New York production, which toured X number of cities, regional theaters, et cetera, which we went into in prior discussions, do the, those investors who invested in the New York production participate in the London production? Yes. The typical format would be that the rights to the London, the rights, performance rights, the literary rights, to present the show in London would be owned by the New York production partnership. Then, if you had to raise additional capitalization yeah. to present the London show, then the London show would get rights from the New York show and typically would pay a reasonable percentage of the box office, perhaps one to two, if not five percent, depending upon recoupment, for the right to present the same show in London. So you're saying that the original investor who invested in New York production has a success, it goes to New York, but the original investor would get X percentage from the London capitalization. That is correct. Is that right? So that way everybody is sort of taken care of. Correct. And uh, it works that way. Well, what about uh, uh, merchandising? How does that work? Doesn't the producer have to work out? I'm talking about things, mundane things like T-shirts, which can be, or CDs, or, uh, or masks like they did with Phantom of the Opera. Most shows that are responsibly run, in my experience, would have all of the merchandising rights and all of the merchandising income going into the partnership. There are instances where producers do reserve for themselves some, if not all, of the merchandising. But this is necessary to be disclosed up front right. to the investors. You have to tell them up front exactly what you're going to do, right? Right. And then you can do it. I understand. And pointing on that is another critical thing to keep in mind, is that when you're raising money for a show, you are literally selling investments to the public. And there are extensive federal and state laws, rules, and regulations with which you have to comply. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself not only in trouble with the investor who may demand his money back, but you're going to find yourself in trouble with financial regulators such as State Department of Corporations and the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. Well, Jim, let me ask you this. I happen to know, because I know you for so long, that you as an attorney were involved with the SEC. Consequently, you have a, an idea of the inner workings of it. How does a theatrical producer, a general partner, when he's raising money, avoid an SEC supervision? Basically, the two words are private placement. The mission of the Securities and Exchange Commission is to protect investors in general. The Commission, however, in applying its resources of enforcement, has made numerous rules exempting compliance with SEC rules and regulations. Basically, this is what we call Regulation D, which exempts offerings to sophisticated investors, generally with a net worth in excess of $1 million, or trusts with a net worth in excess of five million dollars. You have to warn them up front, right? Yes, yeah. by disclosure. You know, this is a very interesting discussion for me and I certainly know that it will be interesting for our viewers because many people who are not that, shall we say, educated, if you will, and it's not a disparaging statement about the intricacies of the complexities of the collaborative effort in theater, have to realize that an individual such as yourself, an attorney, has to get into the nuts and bolts which may not be glamorous to certain people, but without it, you can't do a show. Absolutely. You know, it's particularly interesting to me, Jack, that you as an individual who is outside the parameter of the purity of the theater, if I can call it that, how you would address the fact of uh, what James Donovan, as an attorney, stated, that you gotta be very careful, that you have to be very proper with all the uh, legal requirements, and all the government supervision, whether it be the SEC, et cetera. Is it more prominent, if you will, in something that is outside of the theatrical community, or again, are they wedded to each other and do they overlap each other? Well, they definitely overlap uh, each other. And uh, as far as the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, is concerned, legitimate theater, uh, McDonald's, Disney are all the same. Uh, if you are going to go to the public and raise money, 
you have to have full disclosure, you have to have full compliance with the law, and the SEC, which regulates uh, 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 the raising of capital, uh, does not make a distinction between legitimate theater and other areas of corporate America, so to speak. Uh, and what Jim was bringing up is inherent in every private placement memorandum, is inherent in everything uh, I've ever seen in terms of raising capital, and that really comes from uh, uh, the uh, the ills that were done prior to oh, 1934, sure. Sure. Uh, where and they called it blue sky, uh, meaning that I can sell you everything, including the blue sky. Uh, so, what in essence, what is happening now is uh, the SEC, the governmental agency, says you can go out and raise money, but in order to raise money. You can't misrepresent. You can't overmarket and sell the show. You have to really be able to specifically tell people all the the, the pitfalls and uh, problems that they're going to have in terms of investing in a show. You're almost uh, giving them a disclaimer of sorts. Well, you know what's really required, and every producer should and has been doing that. In every private placement memorandum, you have to state this is a high risk investment. Sure. If you cannot participate in that, do not participate in this. And you have to do that. And you have to also reveal what the royalty structure is, which you asked about before. The royalty participants are naturally, to some extent, the producer and always a director and all the creative elements. Right, and, so, that's, and that's, you know, that is not unique, again, uh, and that's why I smile. It's not unique to legitimate theater. You will find that in, that in any private placement memorandum uh, anywhere in the United States where someone is going out to raise funds to capitalize their company. And whether that company is putting on a legitimate theatrical production or that company is making widgets somewhere in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, it's the same elements you're going to find in every one of those agreements. In terms of a royalty structure, again, you're disclosing to a potential investor, yes, it's a high-risk situation, but if we we are successful, if we are productive, then in essence what's going to happen is you're going to be our partner in the profits that are coming out of that particular show. The same thing you would say to a shareholder uh, that is making an investment in the McDonald's Corporation or, or, or other type of corporations where they would also have a, a profit potential coming out, high risk, there's no guarantee that there'd be profits coming out of a McDonald's, uh, and just as there's no guarantee there'd be profits coming out of a show. You know what, I, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to note that over the last few years, Theatrical producers have gotten very smart and not greedy, because unfortunately, uh, every industry, regardless of what it is, is permeated with some elements that bring uh, a nefarious tone to it. So what producers have done is they have taken less of a royalty. Everybody has taken less of a royalty until the investor can recoup his money. Once the investor recoups his money, then they go to full royalty, which I think entices an investor, which Absolutely. shows that you're interested in them. How does that work within other areas outside of the entertainment industry? Well, I'm listening to you tell me that, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't think legitimate theater invented that. Oh, uh, no, I don't think they right. did either. I, no, I, you're I think, right. I think who invented that was, again, coming from the corporate side, where you have have angel investors uh, into a new company, and the CEO of that company could not say, you know what, I'd like you to invest $5 million in my company, and by the way, I'm going to take a million dollar salary. Uh, no, the, the investor is going to say, well, if we're putting $5 million into the company, we would prefer that you don't take a salary until we maybe see some profits or take less of a salary until we start to have a payback or a return on our investment, which is now consistent in agreements that, as I understand them, are in legitimate theater. Well, producers have to be very, very careful now if they want to produce another show and another show right. and another show. Right. So, you know, I'm quite sure that there are... Uh, uh, other things you want to get into? Well, I, I have, I, in listening to uh, what Jim Donovan was talking about, uh, one thing comes to mind that I'm curious about is uh, what would be some of maybe the pitfalls or the problems that uh, would be inherent in trying to capitalize a show and producing a show? Uh, maybe you have some views, or Jim would have some views on that. I have some views and some fears, but let's listen to Jim Donovan talk about that. Great.
Most of the problems that I've had to try to extricate clients from are people who didn't make adequate disclosure to investors, people who invested their money and didn't get the full story. And the nightmare <coughs> of that is if you don't make full disclosure, then you have to return the money. Well, all too frequently, the money has been expended, and then you find personal liability coming on to general partners. So my advice is know your investor, which is a classic mantra in the investment community. <laughs> know somebody. You want somebody who will invest $200,000 in your show, and when the show gets bad reviews and closes, you want that person to call you up and say, I really appreciate having had the opportunity to invest, and be sure to call me the next time you get a show. That's wonderful. That's a sophisticated investor. As opposed to somebody saying, I'm going to send somebody around and break your kneecaps, right? Or I'm going to the SEC, SEC right. to, uh, to well, uh, in, bring an enforcement action against you. Oh, my goodness. I really think, Jim, that you're taking the time, these few moments, to get into the legal aspects of how to structure a show legally and otherwise, because as I said, without which that is the foundation. And I greatly appreciate it, and I know that our viewers will, and people like you make it possible for us to get it on, because without you, we can't get it on, or we get in trouble, and we don't want to get in trouble. And thank you very, very much again for being Good. with us. Jim Donovan, I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. It's really, I guess, a cautionary tale, if I could refer to it as that, for an attorney of Jim Donovan's stature and experience to say, you know, you want investors to say, even if they've lost money, which unfortunately in the theater happens with some measure of uh, regularity, you want them to be able to say, look, it was a good experience, it was a worthwhile experience, I was treated well, I got on a shake, and yes, I'll try it again next time. That's why it's important for a producer to kind of map out what you will is a, uh, a, 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 a sea of responsibility. Right. You know, and, and primarily what Jim was saying is, inherent in all uh, private placement memorandums or in the process of raising funds. The SEC specifically states that you have to uh, uh, raise the money from sophisticated, qualified investors. It can't be the little uh, old lady down the block. Like the producers right, on Broadway, right? right? That, takes, that takes her life savings little, yeah. and pumps it into a show because you took her to dinner. Not you per se, but someone took her to dinner. Uh, and they used to said, do that, you of know. Of course they did, but that's why the <laughs> SEC is very specific Absolutely. in terms of being a qualified yeah. investor, being a sophisticated investor, so that you are making those decisions based on qualified information, that's why it's full disclosure, and that you are uh, sophisticated enough to know that you can risk some, <clears throat> if not all, of the capital that you're investing. You know, in a private place memorandum or limited partnership, uh, I don't know the exact number anymore because it's changed, but if you have a limited number of investors, minimal, then you don't have to report to the SEC. <clears throat> it's right. only when you have a mass Right. Grouping, there, there are certain, you know, and, and again, I'm not a lawyer or an accountant, but I'm familiar with the process. There's a, a 504 registration, a 505, and a 506. And in the 504 registration, as long as you only went to, let's say, f under 35 right, uh, right, right. investors, uh, and <clears throat> they were sophisticated and qualified investors, it was less paperwork. You still have to go through uh, a certain degree of compliance and, and openness in no terms question. of what the memorandum no is all about, but you don't have to do as much paperwork in that process. So it makes it easier for a smaller company or a smaller producer to mount a show and go into the community and raise capital. Well, when you go out in mass, there's no reason why the SEC should not supervise it. As a matter of fact, I think it's smart that they do so that it protects the individual investor. Most of the shows I've done in the past have been with a minimal number of investors. Right, and, you, can, and, and you always have the option of uh, <coughs> even one, two, or three investors mm -hmm. that, are, as, as Jim uh, put, are personally known to you that either have invested in your shows before or that y they know you, you know them, uh, and th there are certain things that you can do with them, uh, uh, limited paperwork and limited process uh, to get them to put their money into the show. Okay, well, I understand that. Jack, I really appreciate you taking the time being with us, and I think you've given us a balance 
and I know that it is a balance between the world of commerce and the world of art, which are blending toward each other. And I think uh, with you and I watching and commenting, especially you on Jim Donovan, has given our viewers and our students an inkling into the so-called glamour world of the theater. Thank you again, Jack. My pleasure. Appreciate you coming. Glad and to now be here. For our, uh, for our next uh, video, which hopefully will be soon, we just want to tell you there are many, <clears throat> pardon me, many more aspects to producing for the theater. So stay with us and we will try to touch every arena of what it takes to mount a show for the stage. Thank you.